Hi everyone! Welcome to part two of chapter three. Last time we were looking at the differences between pure substances and mixtures. And we were also looking at physical and chemical changes and physical and chemical properties. We also kind of wrapped up by looking at elements that exist uncombined in nature. And we called those diatomic molecules. And we were using that term Hofbrinkle to remember those elements. But most elements are actually combi found combined in nature to form compounds. And so today we are going to look at how those compounds are made from the elements. And we're also going to learn how to name them. So lots to cover today. Let's go ahead and get going. So like I said, most elements, except for the noble gases and those elements that we learned before, right? Remember we learned about Hofbrinkel and those were those diatomic elements that exist combined in nature. Um, but most other things are always combined with another element out in nature. It's very rare to find a pure element. Um, so they form, instead, they form compounds. And the compounds we're going to talk about today are ionic compounds, when those electrons are transferred. So that's gonna be the focus of today, but you can also form compounds by sharing electrons. The whole reason that these elements form compounds in the first place is they're trying to get to eight valence electrons. This is called the octet rule. So atoms, remember we talked about the fact that noble gases in general are pretty unreactive. This is because they have eight valence electrons, except for helium, which only has two. Um, but the fact that they have eight valence electrons makes them unreactive because they already have eight. It's this magic number in chemistry. Well, all of the ele other elements, except for those noble gases, they don't have eight valence electrons. Remember, we learned how to determine how many valence electrons something has by looking at that group number. So they have, if they have any other amount of valence electrons, then they're trying to form compounds to get to eight. That's the whole name of the game. So a compound is a substance that contains two or more elements that are chemically combined, like water molecules, right? We know water is H2O. That's two hydrogens and one oxygen. So this counts as a compound because there are more than one element that's chemically combined. But, you know, we could break this down. This is coming from our oxygen molecules and some hydrogen molecules, right? And so those oxygen and hydrogen, they combine to form water molecules, okay? So compounds, unlike elements, can be decomposed chemically into simpler substances. So we could actually take this water molecule apart. See, there's, you know, one, two oxygens here, and so that makes one diatomic oxygen molecule. And we know it's diatomic because oxygen is a member of Hofbrinkel. And we'll get more into this in a later chapter, okay? Hydrogen is also a member of Hofbrinkel, right? These are two hydrogen molecules because hydrogen shows up here. Um, but the point is that our compounds, we know that they're compounds because they can be broken down into simpler substances. So I could take apart my water molecules and I could make them into oxygen and hydrogen. So, sorry, I wrote over this, but our elements in our compounds are always combined in whole number ratios. Um, and what that means is that we see water is H2O. So there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. You'll never see something that's like got hydrogen and oxygen and like a half or something like that. These are always going to be whole number ratios. So one, two, three, four, etc. So these chemical formulas that we're going to talk about are abbreviations for compounds. So like water is H2O. That's an abbreviation for that water molecule. It's saying that in the water molecule, there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. This chemical formula will always contain the symbols, so like hydrogen and oxygen, and the ratio of the atoms in the compound. So it's saying for every two hydrogens, there's one oxygen. So it's telling us how many of each element are in the molecule. So here's another one. This is sulfuric acid. So H2SO4. In this molecule, we have two hydrogen atoms, one sulfur atom, and four oxygen atoms. And we know that because of these little subscripts. We have two hydrogens, one sulfur. Do you see there's no one here? In chemistry, we don't write a one there because the fact that this S is there, it's implied that it's a one. 
So we don't write ones, but we'll write all other numbers. So two hydrogens, one sulfur, and then four oxygens. So the subscript to the right goes with the element. And the way we read this off is we say H2SO4. So H2SO4. So again, those numbers that are coming after the element, they're called subscripts. You'll hear me use this term a lot. All it's just telling you is the little number that's coming after the element. So our compounds are going to fall into two different types. There's two different ways that these elements can get eight valence electrons. One of them is called molecular, and that's actually going to be the focus of our next lecture. The focus of today will be on these ionic compounds. Okay, so we're going to figure out these ones today. So the way that we can tell the difference is that molecular compounds like water are held together by covalent bonds. Okay, so this side is going to have covalent bonds, and these are all going to be made up of nonmetals. Okay, the ones that we're going to talk about today, ionic bonds, are held together by attractive forces. And these are going to be made between a metal and a nonmetal. Okay. So again, that's going to be the focus of today. So the, the way that you'll know it's ionic is it'll have a metal and a nonmetal, um, whereas covalent will be made up of all nonmetals. All right, so on to ionic bonds and ionic compounds. So elements that lose electrons really easily, and this would mean that they have a low ionization energy. Remember earlier we talked about ionization energy? Um, so if it has a low ionization energy, then it loses electrons really, really easily. And so that will be metals. And these metals will lose their electrons and they form positively charged ions known as cations. Remember, we learned that cations are positive because cats have paws. I know it was a little bit silly. Um, and then elements that gain electrons easily. So those are the ones that have a high electron affinity. So I'm going to put up here, these ones have a low ionization energy. And electrons or elements that gain electrons easily have a high electron affinity. Okay, so elements that gain electrons easily, like our nonmetals, will form negatively charged ions known as anions. Okay, so metals form cations, nonmetals form anions. And we learned that already, right, when we were talking about the different ions and the charges that they make. Um, but these don't happen just kind of by themselves. They're always going to happen together. The electron that's being lost by one element is actually being transferred to the other one so it can gain it. So every time a cation is formed by an element losing electrons, an anion is also formed by gaining electrons. So these are happening together. And then the attraction between that positive charged cation and that negatively charged anion draws those elements together to form an ionic compound. Okay, so that ionic compound is formed by the attraction between the positively charged cation and the negatively charged anion. And when we look at that type of compound, that's called ionic bonding because it's being formed from ions. Okay, so all of this has to do with that chapter or that section that we learned about ions back in chapter two. So if you don't recall it or you haven't gotten to it yet, please make sure to go review that section on ions because this section that we're covering today requires you to know that information. All right, so like I said, an ionic bond is a bond formed by the complete transfer of electrons from the metal cation to the nonmetal anion. So one of the elements is going to lose electrons and the other one will gain it. And even though they're composed of ions, remember, ions are charged elements. Even though they have charges on those elements, the ionic compounds themselves are neutral. And that's because our ionic compounds contain equal numbers of positive and negative charges. So they'll have an equal, you know, their positive charge overall and their negative charge overall will be equal so that those charges cancel out and make a neutral compound. Okay, so that's what we're going to learn how to do today. 
first step, we are going to learn how to name our ionic compounds because that's actually the easier portion of it. So here's how we go. The name of the cation always comes first and then the anion will be second. So you're always gonna name the positively charged ion first. Usually that's gonna be the metal most times, followed by the anion, which will be the non-metal, okay? The cation's name is what you see on the periodic table. We're not gonna do anything to the name of the cation, um, but the anion, we are going to change it to end in I-D-E, okay? So like bromine will become bromide or fluorine will become fluoride. Um, hydrogen will become hydride, nitrogen will become nitride, etc. So all of our non-metals, right, that second element, are going to change their name to end in IDE. For example, you know this one, right? This is one most people are familiar with, NaCl. This is table salt, right? But in chemistry, we call it sodium chloride. So as you can see, the name of the cation, right, sodium, that stayed the same. We didn't do anything to the name of the sodium. We just looked at the periodic table. We saw that it was sodium. We wrote down sodium. But the second element, we know that's chlorine. But we don't call it chlorine. We changed the name to end in I-D-E. So chlorine becomes chloride. So we call this whole thing sodium chloride. So the only thing here, right, like I said, that second element will end in IDE. So here's some more examples, like this one, Ki, that's potassium, right? Because K is potassium, and then iodide. We changed the name of the ending to be IDE. Same thing here, MgBr, right? We're gonna name this magnesium, and then the second one changes the name to end in IDE. You'll notice it makes no difference at all that that two is there. That two does not show up anywhere in this name. We're just naming the elements themselves. Magnesium and bromine becomes magnesium bromide. Same thing down here. The fact that there's a two and a three doesn't matter at all for our name. We're just going to look at the first element. That's aluminum. The second element is oxygen. So we change that name to be oxide. Okay, so don't do anything with the numbers. Just name the two elements and then change the second name to end in IDE. So let's go ahead and try this one out. Go ahead, pause here, name these compounds just like we were doing before, and then once you're ready, come back and I will show you the answers. All right, let's go ahead and go through this. So that first one, lithium and bromine becomes lithium bromide, right? Go ahead, look at your paper, make sure you wrote bromide, I-D-E. So you change the name of the second element. The next one, magnesium chloride. Next one, aluminum sulfide, aluminum chloride, and then magnesium sulfide. Again, it doesn't matter how many of each element we, are, we have. It doesn't matter those little subscripts when we're naming them. Okay, you're just gonna write the name of the two elements, change the second one to end in IDE. All right, now let's go on to how do we get those formulas? That's the trickier part. I think the naming is pretty straightforward, but getting the actual formula themselves is a little bit trickier. So the chemical formula of an ionic compound tells you what elements there are and the ratio in which they combine. That's what's really important. So those little subscripts that we were seeing, those little numbers, that's telling you the ratio in which those two elements combine to make a neutral compound. So one example is sodium chloride. Remember, um, if you look on the periodic table, that sodium is making a one plus and the chlorine is making a one minus. Okay, so we, they're combining on a one to one ratio um, because that positive charge exactly cancels out that negative charge, so we get NaCl. So that's telling you that for every one sodium, we just need one chlorine to cancel it out and make it neutral. So this is showing you they combine on a one-to-one -one ratio because there's no subscripts. So the sum of the charges of the cations in an ani and anions in an ionic compound is going to equal zero. They're always going to completely cancel out um, to give us that neutral compound. So here, like sodium bromide, 
Na plus is going to exactly cancel out Br minus because it's a 1 plus and a 1 minus. So they can combine on a 1 to 1 ratio and make sodium bromide, just like sodium chloride. But if we look at potassium sulfide, do you see that potassium is a 1 plus and sulfur is a 2 minus? So we actually need two potassiums to cancel out that sulfur charge because potassium is just a one plus versus that two minus. So since we need two potassiums, our chemical formula looks like this. It's telling us we need two potassiums to cancel out that one sulfur charge. So we're gonna look at how to get those um, formulas as we move forward. And I'm gonna show you a, a nice and easy way to get that, okay? So those subscripts, are telling us how many of each ion is required to form a neutral compound. So like this example below, magnesium is a two plus, right? And chlorine is a one minus. That means magnesium is going to lose two electrons, okay? So when he, it loses those two electrons, one of them can go to one chlorine and one needs to go to another one because each chlorine only needs to gain one electron. So we need two chlorines to balance out that charge. So that's why we see our chemical formula as MgCl2 because we need two chlorines to accept those two electrons that magnesium is trying to lose. If you're not sure where these charges are coming from that I'm getting, remember to look at that periodic table that we covered before. Um, the group number will help you figure out what charges of the ions are to be made, okay? All right, so a really easy way to figure out these subscripts is to do this like circle and switch kind of thing, which I will show you how to do it. But essentially what happens is that the charge of one element is going to become the subscript of the other one. And that's going to, that's going to help us figure out what ratio they need to combine in in a really easy way. Okay, so this will be when the charges are not equal. So like how lithium has a one plus and sulfur has a two minus. Okay, so we can kind of deduce that we need two lithiums to cancel out that one sulfur, which is how we're getting this. But sometimes it's not as straightforward. So what we do is we take this two from the sulfur and it goes to the lithium. Okay, so this, the charge of one element becomes the subscript of the other. Same thing here. So this is a one, right? An imaginary one. So that's why there's nothing that ends up out here next to the sulfur. So the imaginary one from the lithium goes to the sulfur. Same thing here. Let's look at barium chloride. So barium is a two plus, so that two is gonna go to the chlorine. Imaginary one on chlorine goes to the barium, right? So they're switching that number and they're going to be the subscript of the other element. Really important though, make sure you're not taking the charges with you. So like the fact that aluminum is a three plus, we're just taking that number. So we're gonna take the three from the aluminum and it's gonna go to the oxygen. And the two from the oxygen is going to go to the aluminum. And I call this circle and switch. So we're gonna circle the number and switch it to the other element. This is the easiest way I have found to write the formulas of ionic compounds. So we're gonna go ahead and go through this. Okay, so here's my rules for writing the formulas of ionic compounds. First step, write the metal ion formula. So you need to go figure out what is your metal and what charge does it make? Again, if you don't remember how to get the charges, you need to go watch that lecture again, okay? And then you need to write the non-metal ion formula. So find the non-metal, figure out what charge it makes. And then you're going to combine them in the lowest whole number ratio. And the way that we do that is we take our charges and we circle and switch, okay? Just like we were doing on the previous slide, but I'm gonna show you some examples. And then, you're going to write the compound formula for the metal and the nonmetal using the subscripts that we determined from step two for each ion. So again, this is kind of your general set of rules and I'm gonna show you how to do it. So an example of a problem, write the chemical formula for barium nitride. So the first step is to figure out the formula for the metal and the nonmetal ions. So our metal is barium and nitrogen is going to be our nonmetal. So we go and we look at our periodic table 
And we see that barium is in that second column, right? It's an alkaline earth metal. And that means it's going to make a two plus charge because it has two valence electrons. So it's going to lose those two valence electrons and make a two plus. Nitrogen is in group 5A, which means it has five valence electrons. So it needs to gain three electrons to make that three minus. So since barium lost two, it made a two plus. Since nitrogen gained three, it made a three minus. Um, again, if you look at the periodic table, and you'll have to excuse my drawing, I'm gonna draw you a quick little periodic table here, okay? These elements make a one plus, and then a two plus, and then we have three plus, and we said skip the ones that are four, and then we have three minus, two minus, one minus, and then not the noble gases, right? Um, so if you don't remember that trend, please make sure you're solid on figuring out the ion charges because you're really going to need them. That's where I keep getting these numbers that I'm talking about. But once you get the, uh, the charges for each one, the fact that barium is a two plus and nitrogen is a three minus, then we can go on to the next step. If the charges are not equal, so do you see that this is a two and this is a three? So our charges here are not equal. So if they're not equal, then we are going to circle and switch to find the formula. So we're going to take those numbers, right? The two plus and the three minus. And again, don't take the charges with you. So we're just using the two and the three and we're going to switch them. So the two is gonna to go to the nitrogen and the three is going to go to the barium. So we get Ba3, again, remember this three went to the barium from nitrogen, and then N2, that two here went to the nitrogen. Let's try another one, magnesium oxide. So again, we're going to look at our periodic table and we're going to see what ions are formed. We're going to see that magnesium is our metal and it forms a two plus because again, it's in that second column, right? It's an alkaline earth metal. So that means it's going to form a two plus. And then oxygen is our non-metal. So it's in group 6A, which means it forms a two minus because it needs to gain two more electrons to get to eight valence electrons. So now it says determine, you know, whether the charges are equal and opposite. Do you see that this is a two and this is a two? So since they're both twos, they're equal and opposite, we are not going to circle and switch. Okay, really important here. Because that's a two plus and that's a two minus, these are already going to exactly cancel out because they are equal and opposite. So no circling and switching here, we're just going to combine them together. So this is MgO. So be really careful that you don't write something like Mg2O2, that's gonna be wrong because we didn't need to circle and switch here because they can combine on a one-to-one -one ratio to make a neutral compound. All right, so go ahead and try these out. Um, see if you can get them. Remember, all of these in this column make a, a one plus. These are gonna make a two plus. And then we're gonna skip the transition metals for now. And then these are a three plus. We're not gonna use these ones at the moment. And then three minus, two minus, one minus, and then not using these, okay? So if you don't know this trend, write this down right now. Go find a periodic table, write this down because all of these will make a one plus. All of these will make a two plus, right? And so on and so forth. So now you will know the ion charges um, and that will make this ionic bonding really easy. Um, if you want to, you can remember it as one plus, two plus, three plus, switch, skip, three minus, two minus, one minus, zero, right? One plus, two plus, three plus, skip, three minus, two minus, one minus, zero. So it's going up with the positives and then back down with the negatives. Just make sure to skip this fourth group, okay? So for each one of these, write out the ions, circle and switch if the charges are different, and then write the chemical formula. So go ahead and pause here and then come back when you're ready to go over the answers. Alrighty. So for this first one, potassium fluoride. So we see potassium is right here. And so that is going to make a one plus charge. And remember, we don't write one, so it's just K plus. And then fluorine is right here. So again, that's gonna be F minus because we don't write ones. Do you see that those are equal and opposite? No circling and switching. We're just going to write them together. Just smush them together. All right, same thing for the next one. Magnesium sulfide. So we go find magnesium. Magnesium is right here. 
So magnesium is going to form a two plus because it's, you know, right here, two plus. And then sulfur has six valence electrons. So that means it's going to form a two minus. And you can look above sulfur and you see that's a two minus. So sulfur is a two minus. Do you see that our charges are equal and opposite? We have a two plus and a two minus. So those are exactly canceling out. So no circling and switching. We just write our formula MGS. All right, next one. Sodium and oxygen. So here's sodium. Sodium is an alkali metal, so it has one valence electron and it makes Na+. And then oxygen is here, that's O2 minus. And we see now that those are not equal and opposite, right? We have sodium as a one plus, oxygen is a two minus, so they don't cancel out, so we need to circle and switch. So this two goes to the sodium. Okay, we don't need to do anything with the one from the sodium, just that two from the oxygen is gonna go to the sodium. So we get Na2O. All right, let's try calcium nitride. So here's calcium. So calcium's a two plus. And then nitrogen is over here, it's a three minus. So again, we see that our charges are not equal and opposite. So we need to circle and switch. So the three is gonna go to the calcium. So that becomes Ca3, and then that two is gonna go to the nitrogen, so this becomes N2. All right, let's try lithium and phosphorus. So here's lithium. So lithium makes Li+, plus, and then phosphorus is right here under nitrogen, so that makes P3-. minus. So again, our charges are not equal and opposite, so that three from the phosphorus is gonna go to the lithium. So we get Li, 3p. And then last one, here was magnesium again. We got Mg2 plus, and then fluorine we use again, and that's F minus. So again, these are not equal and opposite, so we have to circle and switch. So that two from the magnesium is gonna go to the fluorine. So we get Mg F2. Okay, so that's how we do ionic bonding. So now I want you to go ahead and pause here and get some practice on this. I need you to complete problems number 11 through 18 on the chapter three lecture worksheet. Make sure you are super solid on ionic bonding before moving forward with this lecture because we're going to use what we've learned so far and we're going to apply it to some different scenarios with metals that form variable charges and polyatomic ions. So make sure you're really good with the basics before you move on. If you have questions along the way, make sure to you know, ask me them again before you move on um, because we're going to use these skills in the remainder of the lecture. So go ahead, pause here, work on these, and then come back when you're ready to move on. Alrighty, so as we've learned before, some of the metals make variable charges, right? We talked about this previously. We said um, the ones that we know for sure, like all of these in group 1A, they make a one plus charge. These all make a two plus. These make a three plus. And then we're gonna skip you know, most of group four. And then we said three minus, two minus, one minus, and we're skipping the noble gases, right? So those are the ones that we can predict from the periodic table. But there are some metals, and you can see these down here, that make variable charges, which means like chromium could form a two plus or a three plus, or like manganese can form a two plus or a three plus, or copper can form a one plus or a two plus. So these metals that have variable charges, those are a little bit trickier and um, have a couple different rules when we're dealing with ionic compounds. So we're gonna go through those right now. Uh, typically, the way that you can recognize these is it's mostly transition metals. Okay, so those are the ones in the middle here. It's transition metals plus tin, lead, and bismuth. We're not gonna deal with bismuth, but tin and lead we will. Okay, so mostly this is the transition metals. So for metals that form two or more different ions, so that's all of these down here, a Roman numeral equal to the ionic charge is written in parentheses after that metal name. So like, remember we saw on this last slide, like iron could make a two plus or a three plus, right? So to specify which one we're using, are we using iron two plus or iron three plus, we are going to put a Roman numeral with parentheses after the name of the element. So like if it has a two plus, we call it iron two. 
if it has a three plus, we call it iron three. So that's going to tell us which ion of iron we're dealing with. So like, you know, copper one plus we call copper one, or, you know, copper two plus would be copper two, right? So all of these are just telling us the charge of the ion. So in a lot of ways, that's actually easier, right? You don't need the periodic table to figure out what your charge of your ion is. You know, is it in group 1A or 2A? Here, that Roman numeral, you're like, okay, it says a two, so that's iron two plus, or it has a three, so that's iron three plus. So kind of easier in that sense. Really important though, if a metal forms only one cation, like, sodium or aluminum or magnesium, then we don't use Roman numerals. This is only for elements that have, you know, more than one ion that they can form. So again, this is mostly transition metals um, with, you know, tin and lead. But if it's one of those other elements, like on the edges, then don't do this. All right, so our rules for naming compounds with metals with multiple charges is pretty much the same as it was before with these ionic compounds. We're going to write the cation name, and then this is the only thing that's different. You're going to write the charge of that cation in Roman numerals after the element name. So just like we were naming, you know, iron 2 and iron 3, you just need to put that parentheses with the Roman numerals after the name of the metal. That's it. That's all that's different. Otherwise, we just write the anion like we've done before and change it to end in IDE. So all the same, except now we're adding in these Roman numerals if it makes more than one charge. So here's some examples. So like normally we would name this like iron chloride, right? If we were thinking about what we were doing before, but we know that iron is a transition metal and that means it can make more than one charge. So here we have iron two. Um, and so here in this next one, you'll see this is iron three oxide copper one phosphide, right? Since all of these have elements that can make more than one charge, that's why we're seeing these Roman numerals, okay? So the Roman numerals are telling you the charge of that element in that compound. So let's go ahead and try and figure this out. Name the following comp compound, and then we have CrCl3. So we notice that chromium is a transition metal. Right? And if you don't have a periodic table in front of you already, I would get one now. So you can see chromium is a transition metal. So typically that means it's going to make more than one charge. So that means we're going to name this as, you know, chromium something chloride. And we need to figure out what that something is, right? What charge is going to go right there? Um, so again, you know, First thing we're gonna figure out, okay, chromium's a transition metal, can have more than one charge. That's how we know we're going to need to use parentheses. So we have to figure out, okay, what goes in parentheses? So the way I like to do this is kind of uncircle and switch. So like CrCl3, like that's one of our compounds, right? Do you see this three out here? When we circled and switched, that three got there. So if we undo the circling and switching, that means the three came from chromium. So this was Cr3 plus combined with Cl minus, okay? So we're like undoing the circling and switching to figure out what the charge of our transition metal is. So that's how we're getting that this is chromium three. We undid that circling and switching. So we call this thing chromium three chloride, okay? And you can always double check. Like once you write your name, say, okay, you know, if chromium was a three plus, chromium three plus, Chloride, we know, is a halogen, so it makes Cl minus. If I was to go and circle and switch, that three would go to the chlorine, right? And we would get CrCl3. And you can double check, is that what I started with? Yes, so therefore this name is correct. Okay, so again, really easy way to figure this out is just to undo that circling and switching. Let's try this one though. Name the following compound. So this is iron and sulfur, right? So we would say this is iron, something sulfide, right? Change it to end in IDE. And we know it's gotta have a Roman numeral because iron is a transition metal that can form more than one charge. So we need to figure out, okay, what is the charge on our iron? If we were thinking about the uncircling and switching, right, like we were doing before, then we would say, well, there's nothing here. So that went from iron, so maybe it's an iron one plus. Well, 
Spoiler alert, iron actually doesn't make a one plus. It makes a two plus or a three plus. But as you can see, do you see there's no subscripts at all? There's none at all. So what that means is that the iron exactly canceled out the sulfur. We know the charge of sulfur is S two minus. We can see that from the periodic table. Okay, so the fact that there's no subscripts here mean that the iron exactly canceled that out. The way that we would get that is if this was Fe2+, right? Because the 2 plus would cancel out the 2 minus and make FeS, okay? That's the only way that we're getting no subscripts is when they are equal and opposite, okay? So this one is a little bit trickier. Um, so we would call this one iron 2 sulfide. But again, the way that we know to do this is the fact that there are no subscripts at all. That means they exactly canceled out. So if I go find the charge of the sulfur, S2 minus, then I know that iron is exactly equal and opposite. It has to be two plus in order to exactly cancel out. All right, so let's try writing formulas now with these metals with multiple charges. So this one says, write a formula for the following cop compound, copper one oxide. So like I said before, I think this mech makes it a little bit easier, the fact that there's that Roman numeral there, because you don't need to go figure out the charge of copper from the periodic table, you see copper has a one after it. That's telling you that copper is a one plus. Super easy. So we just take that Roman numeral and we make it its charge. Just remember, we don't write ones in chemistry. Um, and so then you'll use the periodic table, you'll figure out oxygen is a two minus, right? Oh, and sorry, that one shouldn't be there. My apologies. Um, once you get that it's copper plus an oxygen two minus, you see they are not equal and opposite, and we'll just do what we did before. We're cir we'll circle and switch to get our answers. So this becomes Cu2O because that two from the oxygen goes to the copper, okay? So all of the same rules apply that we were talking about earlier. The only thing that's different is instead of looking at the periodic table to figure out the charge, we just look at the Roman numeral to tell us what the charge of this ion is. All right. Let's get some more practice. Go ahead and pause here and work on problems number 19 through 20 on the chapter three lecture worksheet. That will help you get some practice with these metals with variable charges. Once you're done with those, come back and we'll keep going. Alrighty, so Thus far, we've just been making compounds from two elements, right? One metal and one non-metal. Um, and so these are actually called binary ionic compounds, where we're just making it between two elements. Sometimes though, we will have these things called polyatomic ions that show up. And these polyatomic ions are a group of atoms with an overall ionic charge. So these are not compounds. These are a bunch of atoms together that overall have a charge. So like this one has one nitrogen and four hydrogens um, and an overall charge of one plus, And we call this ammonium. Or this one has one nitrogen, three oxygens, and an overall charge of one minus. So when we have a group of atoms together with an overall charge, we call that a polyatomic ion. So poly means many or several. So several atoms with a charge. Okay, so polyatomic ions, several atoms with a charge. So these polyatomic ions will also participate in ionic bonding because they are ions. So they're usually going to be negatively charged. In this class, the only one that's positive is gonna be this one, the ammonium ion. All of the rest of them will be negatively charged and so they'll take the place of the anion in our ionic compound. You're actually kind of familiar with these. These polyatomic ions show up a lot in substances that we use every day, right? If you were to look at the back of your shampoo bottle or you know your fertilizer, you're going to see these terms out in your life. So like this one, a plaster cast is made of you know, CaSO4. So the calcium, right? We've been talking about calcium before, that's our cation, but the SO4, that's actually a polyatomic ion, that's sulfate. And together that makes a plaster cast. So if you've ever you know, broken your bone, um, then you're actually probably familiar with this. Uh, another one that you might see is this one, NH4NO3. So we actually have two different polyatomic ions here. 
NH4 is our ammonium ion that we were talking about before, and NO3 minus is nitrate. You may have heard of nitrates. Um, you need nitrates in your soil to help you know, your plants grow and, and things like that. Uh, so nitrates are really important. So if you look on a bottle of some fertilizer, you're likely to see them talking about nitrates. So these polyatomic ions aren't just in chemistry, you'll see them out and about all the time. And I know you're really excited to see these words again, but I have more things for you to memorize. Um, and again, the sooner you make these happen, the better. I would put, you know, the formula on the front and the name on the back and just start memorizing these. Okay, so like this one, C2H3O2 minus, that's acetate. Make sure you're really careful and you know which numbers go on the bottom and which things go on the top. Like this negative charge is actually on the top here and this two is on the bottom, okay? Or like carbonate is CO3 on the bottom, two minus on the top. Okay, so make sure you're paying attention to where these, um, you know, charges go, or, you know, are the, are the numbers on the top, the numbers on the bottom. So I'm gonna make a no like this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, oh, and this one. It's a little bit hard to tell, but those ones that I've put dots by, those are all one minus charge. So that negative charge is actually up on the top. Don't make it go down on the bottom with the number. Um, I know that's a little bit tricky to see here on this slide. I think everything else is pretty clear. Um, there are a lot of polyatomic ions. I have picked the most popular ones for you to memorize. I know it seems like a lot, but trust me, there are many, many more. Um, and if you go on to Chem 1 and Chem 2, you'll be responsible for learning a lot more of these. Um, but like I said, I just picked the most common ones uh, for this class so we can just get familiar with using them. All right, let's see how to name ionic compounds that have those polyatomic ions in them. It's pretty much the same as how we've been naming everything else. Uh, you just need to have the polyatomic ions memorized. Um, but if you don't yet, because you know we're just talking about this in this chapter, um, I would go find this sheet that's called um, ions to be memorized. You can find this on Canvas um, in our chapter three module and just go find it. It says ions to be memorized. And I would make sure to use that while you're working on these lecture worksheets. It has all of the normal ions that we talked about, like that are easy to predict based on the group numbers. It also has all of the metals with variable charges that we've talked about so far. And it also has the polyatomic ions memorized or that you need to memorize. Okay, so I would have that paper handy while you're working on these. And then, you know, like I said, make some flashcards that you can carry around with you and practice them while you're, you know, sitting in line at the doctor's office or something like that. And just pull them out and, and run through them really quickly. Um, but to name these, it's actually really, really easy if you have your polyatomic ions memorized. All you do is you're going to name the cation and then the anion. And that's about it. So, um... Like I said, all you really need to do is memorize the name of the polyatomic ions and it becomes super duper easy. So like this one, NaNO3, the first one, right? That's sodium. And like we've done before, the first element name stays the same. This element, right, sodium is one of them on the edges. So it doesn't form a variable charge. So we don't need the parentheses with the Roman numeral. We know that sodium always makes a one plus. So that's why it's just sodium, no Roman numerals. Now this over here, NO3, that is our anion. So what I would do is I would go find NO3 on your ions to be memorized. And it's actually, will show up as NO3 minus. Okay, but all that really matters for naming it is the fact that this is NO3. And you'll see that the name of this is nitrate. And so we just write down the name just like it is. We don't change the ending. We don't do anything like that. We just find the name of this polyatomic ion and write it down. Same thing here. Our first element, that metal, that's potassium, okay? And again, it doesn't form multiple charges. It's an alkali metal. It always forms a one plus. So no Roman numerals. We just write down potassium. And then CN, that's a polyatomic ion. We go find our ion to be memorized sheet. We see it's CN one minus, okay? And so the name of that is cyanide. So we just write down potassium and cyanide, okay? So again, as soon as you have those ions to be memorized, memorized, all of this will become really easy. Writing the formulas, though, 
is a little bit trickier. Naming them, super straightforward. Uh, writing the formulas is a little bit trickier. It's just the same as what we've done before, but now you need to know the formulas for those polyatomic ions in order to write the formula of your ionic compound. So here's one. Write the formula for magnesium nitrate. First up, figure out the cation and the anion. So magnesiums are cation, nitrates are anion. Do you see that this ends in A-T-E? Um, our polyatomic ions most of the time end in A-T-E or I-T-E. Not always, but if you see A-T-E, that should clue you in that this is a polyatomic ion and not nitrogen. Because nitrogen, would remember, would end in I-D-E. Nitride tells you that it's nitrogen, N3-. Nitrate tells you it's a polyatomic ion, that's NO3 minus. And again, we know that for now by looking at that, you know, ion speed memorized sheet, but soon you will have this memorized. Okay, so cation and anion, there they are. Magnesium is two plus, nitrate is NO3 one minus. So then do you see that the charges are not equal and opposite? We have a two here and an imaginary one here. So again, since the charges are not equal, we have to circle and switch. So when we do that, the two is gonna go to the nitrate, the one is gonna to go to the magnesium. Just the same as we've done before, nothing exciting. Um, the only thing that's different here is that this two needs to go to all of the nitrate, this entire thing. So what we do is we put all of the nitrate in parentheses, okay? So the N, the O, and that three, all of that goes in parentheses. Everything except the charge goes in parentheses, and this two will go on the outside. Because if we didn't put parentheses, let's just say, if we didn't put parentheses, it would look like that, right? And you would think you would have 32 oxygens uh, and you would only have one nitrogen. But no, we need two of this entire thing, two nitrates. So we put that in parentheses so the two kind of distributes inside like math, okay? So whenever you have polyatomic ions and there needs to be a number on the outside, we're gonna put that polyatomic ion in parentheses. Um, and this is important, you have to do the parentheses. Not optional, you have to. The only time that you're not going to do it is if there's just one. Like if there's no number that you're gonna put here, then we don't put it in parentheses. But if you need a number for that polyatomic ion, have to use parentheses. So let's try some more. Write the formula for aluminum carbonate. So again, we're gonna figure out our ions first. So aluminum is a three plus, right? We go look at our periodic table, we see aluminum's a three plus. Carbonate, again, do you see this ends in A-T-E? Usually that's a pretty good clue that that's a polyatomic ion, and so we'll go look at that ions to be memorized sheet. So now we have our ions, okay? So we're gonna circle and switch because they are not equal and opposite. We have a three versus a two, so we need to circle and switch. Whoop, my apologies. The two is going to go to the aluminum, right? And so we get Al, two, right? That two went to the aluminum and the three needs to go to the carbonate. But remember, it's going to go to the entire carbonate, this whole thing. So we're going to put all of the carbonate in parentheses except the charge. So don't include the charge, but all of the rest of it. And then that three is going from the aluminum is going to go on the outside. So Al2CO33. So again, that two goes to the aluminum. The three needs to go to all of the carbonate. So we had to put the carbonate in parentheses. Let's try sodium sulfate. So again, we figure out our ions. Sodium is Na+, and again, sulfate ends in A-T-E. That's usually a clue that it's a polyatomic ion. So that two is going to go to the sodium. Do you notice that there's no number here, right? There's an imaginary one. So we're not going to put anything on the outside of the sulfate. So we don't have to put the sulfate in parentheses. So we're just gonna put Na, and then that two from the sulfate, right, is gonna go there. And then we're just gonna write the sulfate as it is because that, you know, there's nothing here that needs to go on the outside. So we just write Na2SO4. All right, so today we have covered ionic bonding, okay? So ionic is a metal and a non-metal, usually. Um, so the way that we name this is it's either gonna be a metal or the ammonium ion. Remember that was NH4 plus? That's gonna be our positively charged cation, right? Our um, polyatomic ion that you can sometimes see. If it forms only one ion, then we're just gonna write the name of the element. But if it forms more than one, then we need a Roman numeral, 
Okay, so that's how we name the positive stuff. You're either going to have a Roman numeral or you won't. That's pretty much it for the metal side. For the non-metal, you're either going to have one ion, right? You're going to either have a non-metal or you're going to have a polyatomic ion. If you have a non-metal, then you're going to change the name to end in IDE. If you have a polyatomic ion, you're just going to use the name of the polyatomic ion, whatever it is. So this is your little flow chart, right? You can figure out, you know, your metal, does it form more than one positive charge or not? And your non-metal, is it going to be, you know, just a non-metal or is it a polyatomic ion? And then this will tell you how to name it. So we have covered a lot of ground with our ionic bonding today. We've learned how to write out our ions and circle and switch for just normal everyday ionic compounds. We've also learned how to do this same process with metals that form more than one charge. And we said that when we do that, right, that charge of the ion is going to need to be put in parentheses after the name of the ion, right? So like iron three or iron two. And we also said sometimes we have another name, like iron two is ferrous, whereas iron three is ferric. So make some flashcards and get working on those as soon as you can. We also said that sometimes there are polyatomic ions that kind of sub in for either our cation or our anion. And those were groups of ions that have an overall charge. Again, more things to memorize. There's not a lot of memorizing in this class, uh, just in general, but in this particular chapter, you need to memorize those um, ions of variable charge and those polyatomic ions in order to be able to do the ionic bonding. But otherwise, those polyatomic ions, they're going to be done just the same as the rest of the ionic bonding. The only thing is that sometimes we need to put our, our polyatomic ion in parentheses if we need to put a number on the outside. So lots of ground today. So to wrap up, I want you to finish or to do problems number 21 to 24 on the chapter three lecture worksheet to get some practice doing these um, writing these ionic compounds and naming these ionic compounds with the polyatomic ions. Okay, uh, We covered a lot of material today, and honestly, the ionic bonding is one of the trickier types of bonding and one of the trickier subjects in this class. So make sure you get a lot of practice doing this so that you're really familiar with how to name these different ionic compounds. As always, when you're going through these, if you ever have any questions, please let me know. I'm more than happy to help. Remember, you also have access to the answer key um, on Canvas in the chapter three module, so you can go through and check your work and make sure that you're naming all of these correctly. As always though, keep working hard. Um, I know this is a tough class, but you're doing great. If you ever have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys next time.